So a fraction whose numerator and denominator are polynomials is called a rational expression. Now, a reminder that for rational expressions, the numerator, the denominator can either be a real number, uh, an integer, it can be a variable, it could be potentially the product of a real number and variable as we see 2x as our numerator, that is 2 multiply x. It also can be a polynomial expression. For our first denominator, 3 over x plus 4, the denominator is the binomial x plus 4. For our second rational expression, again, it expresses or represents a fraction where the numerator is the product of two factors. It says 2 multiply x. Although we have not seen a denominator exactly written as 2x, we have visualized some denominator of the form 2 times x. What about our fraction 6 fourteenths? 6 fourteenths is a numerator with 6, and 6 can be expressed as 2 times 3. Well, for example, what if x is equal to 3? If x equals 3 for our second expression, our numerator is 6. If x equals 3 for the denominator of our second rational expression, 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 4. So if x equals 3 for our second rational expression and the denominator 9 minus 12 plus 4 is negative 3 plus 4, which is 1. So in the numerator, 2 times 3 is 6. In the denominator, if you plug in a 3, notice that for these expressions, a lot of the things we do typically are evaluate them. In other words, take a number for the independent variable x and input it or substitute it into the variable. If x equals 3, 2 times 3 is 6 in the numerator. If x equals 3 in the denominator, 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 4, 9 minus 12 plus 4, negative 3 plus 4, that is 1. So for that second rational expression, if x equals 3, what does our expression represent or equal? It represents the fraction 6 over 1. And we know due to our rules of dividing, if you divide a number by 1, 6 divided by 1 is just 6. So that's the idea behind this here, is that this polynomial 2x divided by polynomial x squared minus 4x plus 4, this represents some number. It's either going to be a whole number or it's going to be a rational number of fractions. Now, 6 over 1 or the number 6 is a fraction, 6 over 1, but we wouldn't want to leave it as this. This is not simplified. We would want to simplify wherever possible. And for this here, 6 over 1, 6. So going down to the definition, let u and v be polynomials. So notice right there, let u be represented by x squared minus 5x. You can let v be represented by the expression x squared plus 2x minus 3. The idea here is that some polynomial divided by some polynomial is defined to be a rational expression. Because why is that? A polynomial represents a number. A number divided by a number is a rational number. But anytime a variable is involved, we can't call it a number. We have to call it an expression because this value can change. A variable is ever changing. Plug in 3 or plug in 5 or plug in 7 so it expresses or represents uh, some number. It says here the domain of this rational expression is the set of all numbers for which v is not equal to zero. Well, what does this mean? What have we said thus far? At the beginning, we said that the denominator of a rational number or the denominator of a fraction can never equal zero. In this case here, what is v? v is our denominator. So the definition is saying for our rational expression, you can plug in any number you want to that rational expression as long as the denominator does not equal zero. If you think about this one that we just worked with, look at the rational expression 2x over x squared minus 4x plus 4. We looked at this rational expression and we said, let's plug in a 3. To plug in 3 for x is to substitute x into the variable. In other words, this is an input value because we are inputting it. We now want to know what is the output value? What is the value of the expression when x is 3?
when x is 3, we evaluated the numerator to get 6. And the denominator, 3 squared is 9. Minus 4 times 3, so we are subtracting 12. And then adding 4. Note for uh, the, this terminology here, there are no parentheses. So for the subtraction and addition, we would just read left to right. If we do 12 plus 4 to get 16, 9 minus 16 is negative 7, we get the wrong expression. Recall that our priority here for addition and subtraction, PEMDAS says addition and subtraction is in the same hierarchy. So here we just read left to right. 9 subtract 12, add 4. 9 minus 12, negative 3. Negative 3 plus 4, or 4 minus 3, is 1. And so when x is 3, our expression equals 6. Now, for later on when we discuss functions, we would say that when we evaluated the function at 3, if we wanted to set, give this some sort of name, we can call it f of x. f of x, where f represents a function, what is a function? Think about your television set. Your television is a function because you pick up a remote and you hit the power button. When you input by pushing that button, your input is power. What is the output? What do you get out of this? Well, the TV turns on. If you go to ESPN, you turn to 206, you input 206, and a function happens. Well, it transmits that information to your television, and your television turns to ESPN. That's the output. So for a function of a television, the function of a television is to understand what the input is on the remote control. The function takes the input and something happens. That's the function. And what's happening there, the transmission occurs. The television signal picks it up, changes the channel. So the output is television channel comes on. Same thing here with a mathematical function. What is a mathematical function? Well, first and foremost, a mathematical function is denoted using this terminology here. This is read as, you would say, f of x. Well, what is f of x? f is the function. x is the independent variable or the input value. This is the ever-changing number. We can, make, we can make that 3 as we did here. We can make it 5. We can make it negative 2, whatever. This is the function. This is always the function. We're changing x. But how does the function change as x changes? That's something we're interested in. That's something we want to be mindful of. How are the function values changing as the value of x changes? That's a very big concept for applied calculus. And for any uh, study of rates of change, uh, for any company, any business, they want to know, well, how is our money changing as time changes? How is our money changing as our unit production changes? Do we need to make more items? Do we need to make less? How is supply and demand? How is that affecting our our profit. So seeing that relationship between those two variables, that's what a function does. A function shows us a relationship between two sets of numbers, the domain and the range. The domain are the numbers that you plug into a function. The range are the numbers that you get out of it. In this case here, what do we say the domain was? It's all the numbers that you can plug into an expression or function such that your denominator does not become zero. Because remember, if you divide by zero, go to your calculator and type in six divided by zero. It will say undefined. The real number system is not defined to be divided by zero. Because as we said, you cannot divide by zero. If you have $10 and you divide it into zero people, well, how much money does each person get? There are no people. So how can you logically divide $10? 10 divided by zero is undefined because we cannot divide by zero. Thus, for rational expressions in the domain of a rational expression or rational function, once we introduce the notation here, the function equals this. So what is the function equal when x is 3? The function, when x is 3, well, what does the function need to do? The function needs to take 3 and multiply it by 2. The function needs to take 3 and square it and subtract four times the three and add four and then divide those two numbers to give us six. So the function when x equals three, well, the function equals six. So that's how we understand that notation. That notation, the function when x equals three is equal to six. You can read it very quickly as f of three equals six. So that this means the function is six when x is three. What about when x is hmm, negative three?
And maybe I ask for this question for this expression, for this function. Again, mathematically, a function means that we're going to do arithmetic. A function has multiplication, has addition, has subtraction, has division. For us, this function has all of it. A rational expression or a rational function is simply the quotient or the division of two polynomials. What we want to do, evaluate this function. What is this function equal when x is negative 3? So in other words, what is f of negative 3? So we determine, we determine this by plugging negative 3 in to our function. In the numerator, 2 multiply x is 2 multiply negative 3. In the denominator, we're squaring our x value. What is our x value? It's negative 3. So we are going to square negative 3. Notice how I put parentheses around it. We do this to make sure that we square not only the 3. We know that 3 squared is 9. But when you square negative 3, what is it? It is not negative 9. We have to remember that rule. When you square a negative number, it's always positive. Because what does that mean? You have two factors of negative 3. A negative 3 multiply a negative 3. Negatives cancel, giving us a positive 9 there. So we want to be mindful of that. Minus 4 times x is minus 4 times negative 3. In our numerator, we do not get 6 this time. We get negative 6. What about our denominator? As we said, squaring a negative 3 becomes positive 9. Here, we are subtracting 4 multiply negative 3, which is negative 12. So again, as our rule of arithmetic states, if you subtract a negative number, well, in arithmetic, you are adding a positive. So subtract negative 12 is equivalent to adding 12. And then lastly, here we add 4. So let's look to simplify this expression. Numerator, negative 6. Denominator, 9 plus 12, 21 plus 4, 25. The question here now becomes, for this fraction that is a negative, for our fraction we see that it is a negative divided by a positive. Remember a negative number, a negative 6 divided by a positive 25. Well, this is going to give us a fraction that is negative. The numerator is no longer negative. The fraction itself, once we perform the division, negative 6 divided by 25 is equal to the fraction negative 6 25th. So the numerator, we don't look at the numerator as negative. We know that the arithmetic told us the numerator was negative, but our solution here, or in this case here, our function, when x equals negative 3, the function is equal to the fraction negative 6 25th. Now we want to note, for this fraction, that's why we had the video at the beginning. Why do we want to learn about simplifying fractions when we're talking about rational expressions? It's because when we evaluate a rational expression by plugging in a value for x, by doing the arithmetic here, when you plug in this number negative 3 into the variable x, there's no longer a variable. This just becomes good old arithmetic and order of operations that we would discuss in middle school. And that's what a lot of calculus and algebra deals with, too, is understanding the theory behind it. But once you understand the theory, it's really just adding and subtracting numbers, multiplying and dividing, etc. Here, by plugging in a negative 3 using that substitution, the function when x is negative 3 is equal to negative 6 25ths. We know this is simplified because using prime factorization, 6 is the product of 2 and 3. And 25, that perfect square 25, is 5 squared, or in other words, 5 times 5. So this fraction, which is that value there, the 2 times 3, well, both of those numbers are prime. 5 times 5, both of those numbers are prime. So we cannot cancel out any of these factors because they're not common. Therefore, we revert back to how the fraction was. And we say that this is our simplified expression. 
So f of negative 3 equals negative 6 25ths. This is a negative number where the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So this is some number between negative 1 and 0. And now because this 6 is much closer to 0 than it is 25, this is a negative number that's closer to 0 than it is negative 1. So for this second rational expression, we evaluated the function when x was 3. We evaluated the function when x was negative 3. I encourage you to plug in a few more numbers and see what this function is equal to for your specified x values. Do you want to plug in 5 or negative 5? Do you want to plug in 2 or negative 2? Maybe even plugging in 0. What would happen when you plugged in 0? Well, now I want to bring our attention to the idea of the domain. It says here the domain is the set of all numbers for which v does not equal 0. In other words, the domain is the set of numbers that you plug into the function where the denominator doesn't become 0. We plugged in 3. When we plugged in 3, our function equaled 6. When we plugged in negative 3, our function was a fraction, negative 6 25ths. Neither of those numbers produced output values or function values with a denominator of 0. Therefore, the x equal to 3, the x equal to negative 3, both of those numbers are in the domain of our rational expression. Remember, the domain is the set of x values. So the value of 6, the value of, or excuse me, yeah, the value of 6 and negative 6 25ths, those two numbers are in the range of our function. Those are the output values. The output values are the values that the function equals. The input values are the values that we're plugging into the function. So those input values consist of the domain, or they make up the domain. The output values make up the range. Now, at any time, if you plug in a number, compute the arithmetic with the function, and the arithmetic gives you a zero in the denominator, you would come to a screeching halt and say, this number here that I plugged into the function, whose arithmetic gave me a zero in the denominator, that number that I plugged in is not a part of the domain because it does not fit the definition. It says the domain is the set of numbers for which V does not equal zero. If I plug in a number and my bottom number becomes zero, that number that I plugged in is not in the domain. What number is that? How do I know what number uh, will plug in here and give me a zero in the denominator? In some cases, it might be very obvious what number it is just by observing the denominator. For example, 3 over x plus 4, that very first top left rational expression, our denominator is x plus 4. What number would you plug into x to make that denominator 0? Well, if I plug in 0 for x, 0 plus 4 is 4. So my denominator is 4 when x is 0. That's fine. That's, per that's perfectly okay. If I plug in the number 1, well, that becomes 5. If I plug in 2, it becomes 6. Seems like I'm going the wrong way for trying to get 0. If I plug in negative 2 to 4, well, negative 2 plus 4 is 2. If, however, I plug in negative 4 to my denominator of x plus 4, well, if x is negative 4, then that expression has negative 4 plus 4, which is 0. So for my first rational expression, x cannot equal negative 4. Because if x equals negative 4, my denominator is 0, and I can't have that according to my definition of the domain. So for the domain of the rational expression, 3 over x plus 4, the domain is every single number that you can possibly think of except for negative 4. Because negative 4 is the only number in existence that makes that denominator x plus 4 equal to 0. And we can observe that by simply substituting negative 4 in for x and using the arithmetic of addition to find that that sum equals 0. But what about our second expression? The second expression is very interesting. The expression or the function equal to 2x over x squared minus 4x plus 4, we note that our denominator here has a degree of 2. The largest exponent for the variable x is 2. This is a quadratic expression. According to chapter 6, a quadratic expression of this form x squared plus bx plus c, according to section 2 of chapter 6, we can easily factor this trinomial if it is in fact factorable. The leading coefficient for the x squared, there is no number written out front. It's understood to be a positive 1. So for this reason, for this trinomial of degree 2, trinomials of degree 2 are often factored into the product of two binomials.
What about 2x? This is the product of 2 times x. So we already have an idea for the numerator. There's only two factors, the prime factor of 2 and the prime factor of x, whatever x represents. It's some number. What about our denominator here? Can we think of two binomial factors that multiply to give us our trinomial? In other words, what two binomials did we FOIL in order to get this trinomial? We ask ourselves for two numbers that multiply to give us positive 4 that will combine or add give us negative 4. If two numbers multiply to give us a positive, but they add to give us a negative, well, two positive numbers cannot add to give us a negative. However, two negative numbers will multiply to give us a positive. Two negative numbers will add together to give us negative. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Negative 2 combined or added to negative 2 is negative 4. So those are the two numbers. Minus 2 minus 2. Well, what multiplies to give us x squared? x and x. Binomial factors, x minus 2 times x minus 2 according to FOIL. If you FOIL this out, x times x is the x squared. Here are minus 2x in the inner product. Our minus 2x for the outer product will combine to give us the minus 4x. And here, minus 2, multiply minus 2, positive 4. So this all checks out. So our numerator has two factors, 2 and x. Our denominator has two factors, but they're the same factors. There's a factor of x minus 2, a factor of x minus 2. Are any of these factors for the numerator and denominator the same? No. So we can't do any cancellations. That's just simplifying when you factor the top and bottom expressions and cancel the common factors. Here, we want to know what is the domain. What is the domain of this function? Well, to find the domain of a function, consider the denominator. And why is that? Look at the definition. The domain is the set of numbers for which the denominator does not equal zero. So in other words, if we only knew what numbers made our denominator zero, then we could just restrict them from our domain set. And think about this. I can plug any, or here we go. I can plug any number I want in there, right? Because there's an infinite amount of numbers in our real number line. Think about negative 20, negative 50, negative 200. Why can I plug those in? Because negative 200, if x is negative 200, I can multiply negative 200 by 2. I can square negative 200. I can multiply negative 200 by the negative 4, and I can add 4 to that, to that value. In other words, for a function that is mathematical, these are made up of numbers, we can plug any number we want into it. But for these rational expressions, we are only mindful that if you plug in a number that creates a zero in the denominator, you would restrict that value from your set of domain values. Our denominator here factors out into the product of x minus 2 and x minus 2. Why is this important? We want to know what value or values of x will give you a zero in the denominator. In other words, if you take your denominator and set it equal to zero, note here that if we take our denominator and set it equal to zero, this looks an, an awful lot like section five of chapter six. By finding the domain of this rational function, we must first take our denominator and set it equal to zero and solve for the variable. This solution or these solutions will tell us exactly what value or values of x will make our denominator zero, which will then allow us to restrict those values from the domain. Because this is telling us the only value or values of x that make our denominator zero. We're getting straight to the point. No, no, no uh, beating around the bush here. Straight to the point. What number for x or numbers? make this expression equal to zero. By factoring, according to our section five, chapter six, in order to solve a quadratic equation, if it is in fact factorable, which we saw that this expression here is factorable, it factors that into our binomial product. Then 
then according to our zero factor property, because the product of these two factors equals zero, zero factor property says one of these factors must equal zero, possibly both of them. Well, in this case here, we have the same factor, x minus two, x minus two. The zero factor property just says, set the factors equal to zero and solve. If I take this factor of x minus two and set it equal to zero, Note that this will give me the same solution as if I take this x minus 2 and set it equal to 0. They're going to give me the same solution for x, and that value is 2. Isolate x is to solve for the variable. Using our properties of equality to add the 2 on each side, balancing the equation, we see here x is equal to 0 plus 2, which is 2. So what does this solution of 2 mean? We, are, we want to know what is the domain of the function. The domain is not x equals 2. The domain is every other number in existence except for 2. So how do I express that? Well, first and foremost, when we get this solution here, we want to say that x cannot equal 2. For this function, x cannot equal 2. We just showed why. Why can't x equal 2? If you plug in 2 to this function, you are going to get zero in the denominator. And let's try that out. If we evaluate this function when x is two, we are saying, what is our function equal when x is two? So what is the function equal when x is two? This is called evaluating the function. We substitute two everywhere we see the variable x. In the numerator, 2 is going to multiply x, where x is 2. In the denominator, 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 4. By inputting our value of 2, the function now takes place. The arithmetic that occurs is kind of like changing the channel when the, the transmission occurs. This is where everything is, is happening. The numerator, 2 times 2 is 4. And our denominator, 2 squared is 4. Minus the product of 4 and 2, minus 8, plus 4. So numerator has the number 4. But what about our denominator? 4 minus 8 is a minus 4. If we take this minus 4 and add it to positive 4, we get 0 in the denominator. And once again, a fraction, 4 over 0, implies we are dividing 4 into 0 equal parts. And to think about it, how can we divide something into 0 equal parts? We can't do that. Logically, does not make sense. So for this function, we say that our function when x is equal to 2, this is actually undefined. It is appropriate for our numerator to equal 0. Think about it like that. If the numerator is 0, say, for example, you have a fraction 0 over 3. The fraction 0 over 3 says if you have zero dollars and you divide zero dollars into three people, if you have three friends and you say, I'm going to give you all equal amount of money from my offering, well, I have zero dollars. I'm going to give you all zero dollars. So you can divide zero by a number. You just cannot divide by zero. Zero cannot be a part of your denominator. In any situation where you substitute a value into the function or you plug in a value and your output value is some fraction where the denominator is zero, this is not a recognizable fraction. This fraction does not exist on the real number line. This is a number, or this is a construction that is undefined. So because our input value, when we plugged into, it gave us a number with a denominator of zero. Remember the domain said, it's the set of numbers for which the denominator is never zero. So we would say that X cannot equal two. That is something we would want to consider for this function. How do we express that? 
And as we've said here, our number line is infinite. All the numbers that we can plug into this function, we can plug any number we can think of. Negative 417.83975, doesn't matter. Anything bizarre and wild that you can think of. The only number you can is two. So think about that. On this entire number line, this infinite number line has these infinite numbers. So, so dense that anything you can think of, there's just so much more that are bigger, smaller. Wherever you're at, you can always find a number uh, smaller or larger um, just by using a few little uh, mathematical quirks. But here, this infinite number line where you can plug any number into this function that you want, you just can't plug in two. When you plug in two, you get a denominator of zero. That's the only number that'll give you a denominator of zero. And you can confirm that by looking at the equation, uh, setting the denominator equal to zero. There is one and only one number that will give you a denominator or give you uh, a zero in the denominator, and that's two. So what we're saying here for this infinite number line that goes all the way as small as negative infinity, as large as positive infinity, if we're at two, well, of course, we're over here on this positive side, but any other number, 2.1, 2.5, 5.7, uh, pi, negative pi, uh, zero, right? If you plug in zero, you get zero in the numerator, but you get four in the denominator. Zero divided by four is just zero. So our function, when x is zero, our function equals zero. That's totally fine. That ordered pair is the ordered pair zero, zero, which is the origin on an xy plane. And we'll get to that uh, before too long. Let's see right here. What is our domain? Our domain is every number in existence except for two. Well, how do you express that? Interval notation says any number from negative infinity, any number to two, just not including two. Also, what about the larger numbers? Any number larger than two. So, and then this, of course, goes all the way to positive infinity. So we're looking at these two intervals. Our domain, the numbers that we can plug into this function, we can plug in any number we want except for two. Two is the only number that makes our denominator zero. So that means any number less than two. So in other words, x can be smaller than two. Or. What else can x be? x can't equal 2, but x can be greater than 2. x can be larger than 2. So our domain, any number less than 2 or any number larger than 2. With interval notation, what is the interval that is represented by the inequality x less than 2? Well, any number less than 2 goes towards negative infinity. An interval says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at this number and I go to this number, from this to this, from negative infinity to positive two. So from negative infinity to positive two. Now negative infinity, if you can recall the interval notation that involves either parentheses or brackets, negative infinity is just a symbol. It's not a real number. We cannot take this symbol and plug it in for our variable x. For this, we will use parentheses always for negative infinity. Now, what about two? Is two included? The domain is a set of numbers, and a set of numbers can be represented as an interval of numbers because it's an infinite set of numbers. There's an infinite amount of numbers from negative infinity to positive two. Now, two is not included. We said x cannot equal two. So for any number that is not included within the set, we will place parentheses around it. If the two was to be included, we would use the bracket notation. And you can see this on your keypad. If you look at the um, symbols above your digits nine and zero, that is your left and right parentheses. The bracket notation is just above your enters, uh, your enter button. You can see there uh, right to the very right of P, you have your left bracket notation, and then to the right of that, your right bracket notation. Now for the second interval, this interval here starts at two and it approaches positive infinity. For negative infinity, we cannot plug it into the function, therefore we use parentheses. For positive infinity, we cannot plug this symbol into the function, therefore we use parentheses. 
Likewise for this two, notice that the two goes into both intervals, but at both rates, the two gets a parentheses because we cannot plug in two to the function. We are not including two in our domain. Domain is a set of numbers. A set of numbers can be represented as an interval of numbers because our domain here is infinite and intervals represent an infinite amount of numbers. Set notation using braces, that notation there represents a set of numbers or a, a set of symbols that is finite or countable. Notice the difference between finite and infinite. Finite means you can count the number of uh, values in the set. Infinite means there are so many that it's never going to happen. So our domain can be any number that is in this interval or any number that's in this interval. These two intervals come collected together, the union of these two, almost like a marriage, right? A union, bringing two together. The mathematical notation for a union, or how could we say the word or when we say x is less than two or x is greater than two, it says that our domain can be any number here or it can be any number here. So this large horseshoe looks like a very large capital U. This represents union notation, and this is the collection of two sets of numbers. Here are set from negative infinity to two. So this is every number less than two. This is every number larger than two. So we literally have every single number in existence in our domain except for two. I encourage you to practice this notation. Look for an example where x is not equal to negative three. How would you write the domain where x is not equal to negative three? You would simply interchange the two to negative three. So if it's all but one number, the notation is gonna fit this description. But what would happen if maybe two or more numbers were excluded from the domain? You would have the union of multiple intervals of numbers. A function is a relation, so a relationship in which two or excuse me, in which no two ordered pairs have the same first component and different second component. In other words, a mathematical function is defined as when you plug in a number for the variable x, your function will only give you one value out of it. For one input value, there is only one output value. It's kind of like the uh, example we used earlier with the television. When you pick up your remote, and you punch 206 to turn to ESPN, you only want it to turn to one channel. The output, the input is typing 206. That's the channel for ESPN. So you input 206, the function occurs, the transmission occurs. The output that we would expect to happen would be that the television turns to one TV station, that is ESPN. We wouldn't, ex we wouldn't want it to turn to two or three or four stations. We want it to go to one and only one station. So for each input, there's one and only one output. That defines a function in society. For each input, there is only one output. And it's the same thing for a mathematical function. When you substitute a value of x into the function and do the arithmetic, the function should only give you out one numerical value. As we saw before, for the previous example, we input a value of x equal to 3, and the output was equal to 6. So the function there gave us that relationship between the number three and six. When you input three, your output is six. When you input negative three, your output was negative six twenty-fifths. When you input zero, the output was zero. That defines a function. So for that rational expression, we can express it using function notation because it fits the definition of a function. For each output, or excuse me, for each input, there is one and only one output. So the definition of a rational function says, let u of x and v of x be polynomial functions. Just as before, with a rational expression, a rational expression is the division of two polynomial expressions. So a rational function is the division of two polynomial functions. Same notation that we're going to work with, except we'll have it, the expression set equal to f of x, and it will allow us to understand the mathematical function just as a television set we plug in a number the function occurs we use arithmetic and then the output occurs for a television set we input the channel the function occurs with the transmission 
and the output gives us the channel that we want, that we desire. So there we have our rational function. Again, the domain is the set of numbers for which our denominator, which here is the polynomial v of x, v of x cannot equal zero. So our interest here for a domain of a function is to seclude our denominator, set the, uh, set the denominator equal to zero, and solve the equation of our denominator equal to zero. Those solutions to that equation are giving us the numbers for which our denominator will equal zero if we input it into our rational function. Thus, we would restrict those values from the domain, understanding that every other number, every other infinite number in existence is a part of this solution, i.e. we can plug it into the function. The only number or numbers that we can't are the numbers that make our denominator zero. So for number 24, let's evaluate the rational function as indicated and simplify if possible. If not, state the reason why we cannot simplify. For number 24, our function f of x is equal to x minus 5 divided by 4x. Noting how this expression looks, this expression has a numerator x minus 5. This expression has a denominator of 4x. This defines a rational function where the numerator's polynomial, of course, is x minus 5, denominator's polynomial is 4x. To evaluate a function is to substitute the value of x into the expression and use the arithmetic to simplify our fraction. For number 24, part a, f of 10 is indicating for us to find the value of the function when x is equal to 10. If x equals 10, for the expression, we have 10 minus 5. And this will be divided by the product of 4 and 10. In the numerator, 10 minus 5, well, it's half of, we're subtracting half of 10. 10 minus 5 is 5. In our denominator, 4 multiply 10, well, 10, 20, 30, 40. So our output here is the fraction 5 fortieths. But once we get that output, we notice that when we evaluate a rational, uh, rational function, the output will be a fraction. The question now is, can we simplify this fraction by determining common factors for the numerator and denominator and thus simplifying them out? 5 is, in fact, a prime number. The only two numbers that multiply to give us 5, 5 times 1. Of course, we understand for, for the sake of factoring, two negative numbers can multiply to give you a positive. So for example, negative one multiply negative five is also positive five. But for the purpose of simplifying our fraction, we're not trying to introduce negative factors. We're just trying to introduce the factors that make up five. Five is positive. Let's just work with the positive values. If I introduce a negative factor in the numerator, I would then have to introduce a negative factor in the denominator in hopes of making some sort of cancellation. So we wouldn't want to do that. At any rate, 5 is prime. What about 40? 40 is an even number, so we know that we at least can divide it by 2, right? Cut 40 in half is the same as dividing by 2. That gives us 20. Well, let's cut right to the chase. Any number that ends in a 0 or a 5 is divisible by 5. In other words, 40 has a factor of 5. But what do you need to multiply to 5 in order to get 40? Well, that's 8 times 5. Right? 8 multiply 5 or 5 multiply 8 will give us 40. For the new expression here, for this fraction 5 40 we have exposed a common factor of 5. So 5 out of 40 or 5 40 is the same ratio as 1 out of 8. And just that idea that if you are going to eat one out of eight pieces of pizza, well, if that pizza was cut into 40 slices, it's equivalent to eating five out of the 40 slices. That's that idea there. That's all it is. Cut a pizza into 40 slices and eat five pieces is the same amount of pizza as if you were to cut the pizza into eight slices and you ate one of those pieces. And nicely here, one out of eight is a really nice percentage. If you divide one and eight, one divided by eight is 0.125. That's 12.5%. If you eat one out of eight slices, you have eaten 12 and a half percent of the pizza. Again, it's very important to work with fractions because fractions so closely relate us to proportions. 
which is how we define probability, and it relates us to percentages, which is how we can view proportions more often. So what is f of 10? Well, our function, when x equals 10, our function equals the fraction 1 8. So what can we say here? We can say that f of 10 equals 1 8. And what we'll see later on is for this rational function, to get a visual, we would graph it on an xy plane, where our x value is 10, giving us the ordered pair. Remember, an ordered pair has xy coordinates. So this ordered pair here for this function, what is the relationship for the two numbers? When x is 10, our function is 1 8, giving us the ordered pair 10, 1 8. Part B, evaluate the function when x is 0. To evaluate the function when x is 0, we will substitute in 0 for the variable x. We have 0 minus 5 divided by the product of 4 and 0. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. The product of 4 and 0 is 0. And we know here that we, for a fraction, a fraction cannot have a denominator equal to 0. So for our function evaluated at x equals 0, our function is undefined when x is 0. Consider the domain of our function. For the domain of our function, whatever number you plug into the function, your output must be defined. It must be a number. So whatever value you plug into the function that your output is undefined, recall that that number 0 now, since we plug 0 into the function, and it gave us an undefined output, we must restrict zero from the domain. This is very easy to see because if you take that denominator of 4x and set the denominator of 4x equal to zero, again, this is how we find the domain of our function. To find the domain of the function, you set the denominator of your function equal to 0 and solve for x. x is being multiplied by 4 to give us 0. Zero factor rule says one of these numbers must be 0. It's not 4. It must be x. To find that, divide each side by 4. 4 times x divided by 4. Well, 4 divided by 4 is 1. 1 times x is x. If you have 0 and divide it into 4, 0 divided by 4 is 0. So what this says here, x equals 0, 0 is the one number that if you plug it into the function, it's going to give you a denominator of 0. And we saw that when we evaluated, and we see that when we set the denominator equal to 0 and solve. Therefore, x cannot equal 0, and our domain of this function What is our domain for this function? Go to the full screen here. As we see, there is only one number that's going to make our denominator 0, setting 4x equal to 0 and solving x equals 0. That is the one and only one number that we will restrict from our domain. Remember how we use that if we are only restricting one number from the domain. It says that because it's 0, on our infinite number line from negative infinity, to positive infinity, we can plug in any number on this infinite number line that we want except for zero. That means any number from negative infinity to zero or any number from zero to infinity, just not including zero. Now, how do we express that in the mathematical notation symbolically so we don't have to say all of that? When we say from A to B, from this to that, we're expressing an interval from 5 to 10, from 20 to 30, that's an interval of numbers. From negative infinity to zero is an interval. From 0 to infinity is an interval. Now we just need to know, do we use parentheses or brackets to indicate whether or not we are using these endpoints that we've expressed? We never can plug in negative infinity and positive infinity, so we use the parentheses to represent that. Parentheses represents you cannot use those endpoints as part of your set of numbers. Likewise with the 0. We said 0 is the only number that's not in our domain. 
the number, again, these are symbols, not numbers, zero is not included. Therefore, just like the negative and positive infinity, we use parentheses. To collect sets together, the domain is this num this set of numbers. Like any number can be in this set or this set. So we use our union notation. It just looks like a big U. So our domain is the set of numbers that lies in this interval or that lies in this interval. And we see, again, that's because zero gives us uh, an undefined fraction. Really quickly, going back to part C and D, because we just expressed that every number but zero is in the domain, that means for parts C and D, we should have no worry. For part C and for part D, we should get an output that is a fraction. So for part C, it says, evaluate the function when x is negative 3. So what is f of negative 3 equal to? Plug in negative 3 for x, negative 3 minus 5. And divide that by the product of 4 and negative 3. So to start simplifying in our numerator, we have a negative 3. So we're already negative. We're already small, right? We're less than 0. We're in the negatives. And when you subtract 5, you're going to get even smaller. Negative 3 subtract 5 to get smaller, negative 8. We're dividing this by the product of 4 and negative 3. That product gives us negative 12. So a negative 8 divided by negative 12. Well, immediately a negative divided by negative, I cancel the negative. Leaving me with the fraction 8 twelfths. Because if you want to compare a negative number to a negative number, it's the same as comparing a positive number to a, to a positive number. Idea that that is why we cancel the negatives. But we just remember that rule, negative divided by negative, always positive. 8 divided by 12 or 8 twelfths, they're both even. Can we factor out something that's maybe a 2? What about something larger? Well, 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. We note that there are two factors of two in the top and bottom, so we cancel a four. We also can view that by writing eight as four times two, writing 12 as four times three. Other than factor of four top and bottom. So there you go, we go back to that fraction two thirds that, that we saw at the beginning of this video. Two thirds. So notice here that the ratio or the comparison of eight to 12 is the same as two to three. Cutting a pizza into 12 slices and eating eight is the same as cutting a pizza into three slices and eating two. You're eating a lot of that pizza, 66.6 .6 repeating percent. There we go. When f is negative three, what is the function, or excuse me, yeah, when our function is evaluated at negative three, the function equals two thirds. And lastly here for part D, Evaluate the function when x is 5. And what is the function equal when x is 5? What is the function equal when x is 5? When x is 5, our function equals 5 minus 5 divided by 4 times 5. And you can see how this fits the description of x minus 5 divided by 4 times x when x equals 5. So when x is 5, the function equals, well, in the numerator, any number subtract itself, 5 minus 5 is 0. In the denominator, if you have 4 or 5 times or 5 4 times, you have 20. 0 divided by 20, 0 divided by a number that's not 0, 0 divided by 20 is 0. So our function when x is 5, the function equals 0. I'll go to the full view there to get a, a better view of that. At the bottom right, you see a diagram there for the real number line. We've been using it thus far. The real number line represents all of the positive numbers in existence, as well as all of the negative numbers in collection with the placeholder of 0. Remember that 0, the origin, 
where we originate before we move in the negative zone, before we move in the positive zone, zero is a placeholder. It's neither negative nor is it positive. It's right there in between. And now, of course, as we get larger and larger, as we move farther away from zero on the right side, we are getting larger and larger, and those numbers are increasing without bound towards positive infinity. So on the infinite number line here, where we start at zero, when we move to the right, we're getting larger, but there is no largest number. So this arrow is in existence. It will continue to get larger and larger towards positive infinity. And it's likewise in the opposite direction. If we're not getting larger, we're getting smaller. So that's why the negative numbers indicate getting smaller. Moving to the left from the origin, moving into the negative zone, as we move further away, farther away from zero, to the left or towards the negatives, we're approaching negative infinity. So numbers such as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are getting larger. Numbers such as negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on, they're getting smaller. With our number line here, we use the number line to view our solutions or our domain for our function, and it'll help us justify uh, expressing our domain in interval notation. Taking a look at part A, find the domain of the rational function. Well, for part A, our function is the rational expression 4 over x minus 2, where our numerator is the real number 4, whole number, integer, where our denominator is x minus 2, a simple binomial that is linear because what is x? It's x to the first power. So we have a first degree polynomial, which is linear. And to find the domain of this rational function, just ask ourselves, is there a number that if we substitute it into the variable x, will it make our denominator zero? Well, for x minus two, is there any number such that when you subtract two from that number, it gives us zero? Well, of course, two. Two minus two is zero. If x equals two, we get a zero in the denominator. We can confirm that by taking our denominator, x minus two, this is for part A, if x minus 2, our denominator is set equal to 0, we want to know, when will x minus 2 equal 0? Well, it's when if x equals 2, going back up here, if x equals 2, then x minus 2 equals 0. Notice how that plays back and forth. If our equation is x minus 2 equal to 0, if x minus 2 equals 0, then x equals 2. And it goes the other way as well. If x equals 2, then x minus 2 equals 0. So the one and only one number for x that will make our function undefined is x equal to 2. Because you see, if you plug 2 into the function, for our function evaluated at x equals 2, this becomes numerator 4 divided by x minus 2 where x is 2, so 2 minus 2. To evaluate this expression using our arithmetic of subtraction, 2 minus 2 is 0. And the fraction 4 over 0 is undefined. When you input 2, your output is undefined. Thus, 2 is excluded from the domain. And 2 is the only number that is excluded from the domain. Visually, and as we've seen this example already, on this infinite number line from negative infinity to positive infinity, every number from negative infinity to 2, every number from 2 to infinity. Writing this out from negative infinity to 2, we can express an interval notation with the parentheses indicating that those values are not included in the domain. For the interval 2 to infinity, right, any number greater than 2 can be plugged into this rational function 4 over x minus 2. So any number 2 to infinity is an interval notation using parentheses to not include the 2 from 2 to infinity. Unioning these together, bringing them together, because our domain isn't just this one interval, 
our domain isn't just this one interval, it's the collection of these two intervals. So for our rational function, 4 over x minus 2, to find the domain here, the domain is the collection of intervals with our union notation. So if you're looking at the homework dealing with the domain of a function, find the symbols and there should be a union symbol for you to use. Our domain can be any number in this interval or, remember union means or, it can be any number in this interval. From negative infinity to 2 or from 2 to infinity, and the parentheses let us know that 2 is not included in the domain. For part b, we see that our function g is equal to 2x plus 5 all over 8. So our numerator is the linear expression 2x plus 5. Of course, x is to the first power. There is no exponent shown, so it's understood to be 1. So this is a linear expression. This linear expression is being divided by 8. If our denominator is 8, it doesn't have a variable involved. For example, part A, we had a binomial involving a variable x. x was a term, minus 2 was a term. Here we have a monomial. It is a one-termed polynomial. And it just so happens that that one term is a real number. For our domain, our domain is the set of numbers such that when we plug them in, it will give us a value where the denominator is not zero. Well, what about this function here? If I plug in a number to the variable x, is there any number that I can plug in for that, in, uh, for that x value such that my denominator will be zero? There is no variable in the denominator, so there is no way for my denominator here to be zero. My denominator will always be 8. And of course, I may simplify down my expression. That is also very possible. For example, if we plug in, uh, let's see here, is there any value that is going to work for me? 2 times 5 is 10, is 15, 15 over 8. If x is 10, 2 times 2, or 10 times 2 is 20, plus 5 is 25, 25 over 8. If x is negative 4, negative 4 times 2 is negative 8, plus 5 is negative 3, that's negative 3 eighths. So no matter what number I plug in for x, I'm going to end up with a denominator of 8, or at the very least, I'm going to end up with a number as a denominator that is not 0. So what does that mean? It means I can plug in any number that I want into this function, because there is no way on earth that I can get a 0 in my denominator. The domain is the set of numbers such that your denominator does not equal 0. Our denominator here, because there is no variable in our denominator, our denominator is always going to be 8 or some real number, so we know here that our domain is every single real number in existence. How do we express that in interval notation? Every single number from negative infinity to positive infinity, because that interval of numbers contains every single real number in existence. In an interval notation, using parentheses, from negative infinity to positive infinity, where the left and right parentheses indicate that we, of course, cannot substitute in those numbers into our function. So you can plug any number you want into a rational function where the denominator is a real number. <clears throat> Give you a moment to look at the examples for part A and B. Pause the screen, if you will, and determine the domain for each rational function. Just recall that the domain is the set of numbers for which the denominator does not equal zero. So to find those numbers that will make your denominator zero, Set your denominators equal to zero and solve for x. The solutions for these equations, these solutions will be the numbers that we restrict from the domain. To find the domain of each rational function for parts a and b, we will set the denominators x squared minus 16 and x squared minus 2x minus 3 equal to zero. The solutions to these equations will give us the values of x that we will restrict from the domain for each function. For x squared minus 16 equal to 0, what number or numbers do you square and subtract 16 to get 0? What number squared minus 16 will equal 0? Well, let's think about that. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 16 isn't 0. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. Minus 16 is 0. Is that the one and only number? Well, there's another one. It's negative 4. The way we can find this, just looking at the expression, remember, for a quadratic expression, 
to solve the equation, it has to be set equal to zero. Now, because that middle term is missing, we can add over the 16. X squared equals 16. Then we ask ourselves, well, what number do we square in order to get 16? That's plus and minus four. Another way to view this is 16 and X squared. 16 is a perfect square. This is a difference of two squares, which factors into the product of binomial conjugates. Think back to chapter six, section four, a difference of two squares. will factor into the binomial product of conjugates. Remember, conjugates are binomials that look identical, but the difference is the plus and minus sign in the middle. Well, you square x to get x squared, and you square 4 to get 16. 4 squared is 16. Putting a plus sign for one of the binomials and a minus for the other. We see there that the FOIL for this, x times x to give us x squared, the inner and outer product here, 4x minus 4x will give us 0x. That's why we don't have that middle term. And then positive 4 multiplied negative 4, negative 16. Zero factor property, set each factor equal to 0 and solve. Setting x plus 4 equal to 0. If x plus 4 equals 0, we get a solution of negative 4. If x minus 4 equals 0, adding 4 to each side, we get a solution of positive 4. So what do these solutions mean? It means that if you input negative 4 into this function, negative 4 times 5 is negative 20 in the numerator. However, squaring negative 4 to get 16 and subtracting 16, you get 0 in the denominator. So evaluating this function at negative 4, the function is undefined. Therefore, we restrict it. x cannot equal negative 4. Likewise, for positive 4, 4 times 5 is 20. However, in the denominator, 4 squared is 16. Subtract 16 is 0. 20 divided by 0 is undefined. Therefore, we restrict the value of 4. So x cannot equal negative 4, nor can x equal positive 4. So how do we express this in interval notation? Now, for interval notation, again, think about it first graphically so you can use the graph to define your intervals. On this infinite number line, stretching from negative infinity, infinity to positive infinity, There are two and two, uh, only two numbers that make this function undefined. Those are the two numbers, negative 4 and positive 4. So on that number line, at negative 4 and positive 4, we are restricting those values. We are not including them. However, every other number on this infinite number line will be included. It's just those two that aren't. In other words, every number from negative infinity to negative 4, just not including negative 4. Likewise, what about in between? Every number between negative 4 and positive 4. Likewise, every number between 4 and positive infinity. How do, we, how do we express this? How do we word this? Every number less than negative 4. Every number between negative 4 and 4. Every number larger than 4. In inequality notation, using those inequality symbols, that's what we would say, right? Less than, in between, greater than. In interval notation, we now see what do we do to disregard these two solutions. We broke apart our infinite number line visually into three separate intervals. So let's collect those intervals uh, using our union notation. Our first interval from negative infinity to negative four. We will collect that with our second interval, and this is from negative 4 to positive 4. I'm running out of space here. I'll, I'll place it there. We will collect these two here, this interval or this interval or the third interval from 4 to infinity. So the union of these three intervals, the collection of these three intervals, define the domain of this function. It looks like a lot, right? It looks like three separate things. It's because two numbers were restricted, thus breaking apart our infinite number line into three intervals. But those three intervals that are infinite, this is an infinite interval. This is an infinite, even though it looks like, right, four to negative four just seems like eight. Eight is an infinite. However, you can always find a smaller number, a bisecting number in between these two values. 
In other words, yes, there's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, but there's also negative 1.5, negative 1.25, negative 2.25, negative 2.1, etc. You can keep finding as many values as possible within this interval. Therefore, this interval is infinite. This interval is infinite, and this interval is infinite. There's an infinite number of values in the domain. There just so happens to only be two values that are not in the domain. That's why it's easier to find those that are not in the domain rather than those that are, because there's an infinite number that are in the domain. So just find those finite, those two, those countable amount, those two that aren't in the domain. Okay, now we look at part B, similar to part A. To find the domain for part B, we take the denominator and set it equal to zero. Solving for this, this equation will give us the numbers for x that make our denominator zero, thus we will restrict them from the domain. Note that the left-hand side of our expression is a quadratic expression, x squared minus 2x minus 3. This is a trinomial where our leading coefficient is understood to be positive 1. So going back to section 2, chapter 6, how do we factor these trinomials if they are in fact factorable? They normally factor, and again, is there a greatest common factor? Can you factor anything out of these three? That answer is no. So if it is factorable, it is the product of two binomials. What times what will give us x squared? Well, that's x times x. That's our product of the first terms. Now, what would be the product of our last terms? Some two numbers that multiply to give us negative three in such a way that they will combine to give us negative two. That is negative 3 and positive 1. Multiply negative 3 and positive 1 to get negative 3, and combine negative 3 and positive 1 to get negative 2. Setting each factor equal to 0, if x minus 3 equals 0, then we get that x equals 3. If x plus 1 equals 0, x equals negative 1. This, of course, comes from our zero factor property in section 5, chapter 6. Uh, for the intermediate algebra class. Because these are the two solutions to our equation, this means that these are the two numbers for our function here, h of x, such that if you plug 3 into this function, you will get a number that is undefined. Let's try that. Plug 3 into this function. In the numerator, 3 times 3 is 9, minus 1 is 8. But what about in our denominator? Plug in 3, 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 2 times 3, well, that's 9 minus 6, which is 3, and 3 minus 3 is 0. That is undefined. Therefore, x cannot equal 3. What happens with negative 1? Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 minus 1, negative 4. So what would our denominator be? Negative 1, when we square it, is positive 1. Ne minus 2 times negative 1, well, the minus 2 times negative 1 becomes positive 2, and then we subtract 3. 1 plus 2 is 3, minus 3 is 0. Negative 4 over 0 is an undefined value, thus x equal to negative 1 is restricted. We don't want x to equal negative 1 for this function, function h of x. Why? Because negative 1 makes this function undefined, so we want to make note of that. So the domain for this function? Well, the domain just can't equal these two numbers. So what's our smallest number, negative 1 here? Negative 1 and positive 3 are the only two numbers that we do not want in our domain. Every other number in the infinite number line is included. That is, every number from negative infinity to negative 1. or every number from negative 1 to 3, or every number from 3 to infinity. Using inequality notation, every number from negative infinity to negative 1 is every number to the left of negative 1, which is every number for x that is less than negative 1. Now, what about these numbers over here? Every number from 3 to infinity is every number to the right of 3, which is every number that is greater than 3. 
What about this one in the middle? The way that we read this, we say x is uh, x represents the domain. These are numbers from negative one to three. In other words, they are the numbers between negative one and three. So if x is a number, which x represents a number that we plug into the domain, if x is between negative one and three, that means that x has to be greater than negative one. This is negative one less than x, which is also read as x greater than one, uh, negative one. But if x is between negative one and three, it's greater than negative one, but at the same time, it is less than three. So x gets sandwiched in between. X is between negative one and three. So the inequality notation, the inequality notation that we work with, oops, and then this is above our interval notation. Our interval notation uh, most often uh, expresses our domain as a set of infinite number lines.